Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London and today I'm looking at a book which has come to us from Cambridge University Press. It's an important book and one I found fascinating. It's called The Law and Finance of Related Party Transactions and it's been edited by two people, Luca Enriquez and Tobias H. Troger. It's part of the Cambridge University Press series called International Corporate Law and Financial uh, Market Regulation. <clears throat> I've given the title of our review the following, Related Party Transactions Revisited, because that's exactly what we've got. Let's have a look at the book first. It's only a short review, this one. You can see the book. It's a hardback. There it is there. There is the spine. And then there's the back. There's some quotes on the back and not much else. Um, what you've got at the back of the book is, um, I'll just get to that, <coughs> there is the index, <coughs> excuse me, which you can see at the back. The index is by page numbering. Um, it's quite a detailed index, which I thought was quite helpful. You can see the start of the index there. Then before that, what you've got is um, quite useful uh, information. You can see the structure from the back of the final chapter that the bibliography section is at the back of the chapter. You do have some footnoting, but no, no paragraph numbering as such. If we go to the front of the book, <coughs> that is the um, basic blurb about the book, which I shall talk about in a few minutes because it's some quotes. Um, then it's, as I said, it's part of this series from the International Corporate Law and Financial Market Regula Regulation series. Uh, and the, the editors there are listed, um, of the, the series editors are listed. Then you've got the basic information setting out uh, what this book is about. Then you've got the blurb from CUP. Then you've got the content section and it's got a list of the contributors. Then you've got a whole series. You've got 17 chapters in total. Each chapter mentions the name of the contributor, so you know who you're actually um, looking at, who's written, written what, and then you get the names of the contributors there. I can't go through all the names in detail because a lot of people have been involved in this book, um, but it's done alphabetically, and then there are some acknowledgements, and then you get to the uh, first chapter. That first chapter is by the two editors. The law and some finance of related party transactions. They put the word some in. <laughs> and it says this just so it gives you an introduction about the book. The separation of ownership and control is a natural feature of corporations. Shareholders routinely delegate decision making power within the firm amongst themselves or to one or two managers. Delegation can be explicit via a consensual decision on who is going to run the company or implicit, such as when investors buy shares in companies where another investor holds a majority stake and there is no side agreement allowing the former to share control. <coughs> so, in essence, you're looking at <coughs> excuse me, transactions and you're looking at how the decision-making process and the delegation takes place. That's the basic introduction. Then from that, we get into a lot of a very substantial detail and you've got a very uh, interesting list. I'll just go back to the front of the uh, book, which is the actual um, headings for each of the chapters, which are looking at specific things. For instance, the majority of the minority approval in a world of active shareholders. Again, we this is, of course, global, but we do have a very substantial amount of of publications looking specifically at the role of the minority shareholder in particular. Then you've got, for instance, you've got chapter 13, related party transactions, the UK model, related party transactions in other jurisdictions and so forth. So you can see how the book is nicely structured. I found it very interesting, um, not merely from the point of view of what, what we now call corporate governance, what I've always called company law because I'm a bit older, but certainly I found the book of some help. So what do I say in essence about it? Having taken the, the basic information, because they say, the publishers say, that a globe-spanning group of leading law and finance scholars have been brought together to give us the cutting-edge research uh, with a comprehensive examination of the challenges which 
legislators face in relating in regulating <coughs> related party transactions in a socially what they call it a socially beneficial way now that's all well and good but let's go to get down to the practicalities of it this book is clearly looking at uh, what the basic aims the, the great aims are but we have to be a bit more um, a bit more practical rather than theoretical because the the work goes on to look at the theoretical analysis of the foundations of efficient regulation with what are known as empirical and comparative studies to base their arguments upon and of course the uh, people reading the book are invited to draw their own conclusions on which regulatory responses will work best for them under the differing circumstances that they're facing and it's part of the Cambridge University Press's International Corporate Law and Financial Market Regulation series of titles which of course are here to update us on exactly where we are at the moment with this particular area of corporate governance and the careful selection of surveyed jurisdictions uh, which the book gives us offers in-depth insight from these expert contributors into a broad variety of regulatory strategies and their interdependence with socio-economic and political conditions because always lurking at the back of, of any problem is going to be politics and um, that is the bottom line because politics creates a legislation which creates a reg regulatory framework so it whatever one says about the problem of politics the fact of the matter is it's always there because that's where our legislation comes from uh, and I think it tries to give a reasonably pragmatic approach therefore I feel that the book itself should be read by scholars certainly policy makers that's civil servants people in the public sector advisors if they have the time that is and of course graduate students may well be looking at master's level um, work um, studying critical in-depth um, and very substantial um, debates on areas of corporate governance. <clears throat> Certainly people doing an LLM may find this, I think, quite helpful, thinking specifically here, of course, of the um, United Kingdom um, and uh, uh, academics in the um, universities in the UK. Now, let me just give you a little idea of what we've got in the book. Three particular areas I think are particularly important. What it's doing, first of all, is the the contributors are giving an extensive analysis of the subject from three areas that's the theoretical the empirical and the compar the comparative perspectives all quite heavy stuff <clears throat> mainly uh, for research purposes i think you'll find that helpful but it does give an analysis which may be of value i don't think it's got a particularly strong amount of um <coughs> direct relevance to the practitioner but it's much more for the academic it also gives readers information which they themselves can comprehensively um, deal with not only on the state of scholarly debate but also on existing policy options that are available as i say the the bottom line on all of this alas is in fact politics because that's where the regulation basically emanates from and that's where the control comes in and of course do remember what we're talking about with corporate governance which is the the control and the responsibility bearing in mind the, the basic statement in the introduction about the delegation of powers and the protection of course what we something we always think about of, of minorities finally what the book does is it brings together various disciplines to present multifaceted insights and various methodological approach approaches which I think will be of again of interest to the researcher the hardback version of this book appeared and was published on the 19th of June 2019 I'm recording this in the summer and the book's also available as um, as uh, an ebook let's just have one last look at the book again there it is hardback there's the front there's the spine and then there's the back just opening it in the middle um, I was talking about the um, specific areas I'll just, just get to the one that I'm looking for which is actually a little bit further on that's right the models this is related party transactions they give it a, an abbreviation of RPT uh, in the chapter heading 
and then this is the UK model so you can see there's an introduction as to what we do in the United Kingdom it's written by Paul Davis this one and you can see again it says RP uh, TS at the top and that's the related uh, as I say just to re remind you related party transactions okay and that's how the chapters are the, the main part of the body of the book after the introductory area that's where it's looking at uh, specific um, jurisdictions. Big thank you anyway to the two authors, uh, Luca and Tobias. Very grateful to both of you and to everybody who has participated in this book and brought it together for us. And a thank you also, of course, to Cambridge University Press for the publication. Um, a lot of people have been involved in this book. I'm very grateful and a big thank you to all of them. Bye-bye.